Bay or something like that. Uh, that's fine. Good afternoon, everyone. Today is 27 October, the year 2006. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum and have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Sergeant Dalton, better known as Sedge, Sedgemore. Sergeant Sedgemore was a link trainer instructor in the Air Force during World War II and was stationed here in Palm Springs from 1942 to 1945. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Sedge, good to have you here. Okay. All right. Now, uh, pronounce your uh, full name and uh, spell it for us, please. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Dalton Sedgemore. That's D-A-L-T-O-N. S E D G M O R E. Okay, and when and where were you born? I was born in Wales in the United Kingdom on the 16th of January 1922. And uh, what part of Wales? Uh, Glamorgan, G L A M O R G A N. And where uh, is that? That's South Wales. South Wales. Okay, as, that, op as opposed to North Wales. That's where uh, King Arthur and the Round Table and all those guys hung out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, did you know Guinevere? Or? No. <laughs> no, I didn't know her. Um, and what was your father's name? Thomas. And what did he do? He was a coal miner. Mm. That's what pretty much most people do in Wales, yeah, isn't that's it? That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, we have, uh, we've had some Yorkshire Terriers and we understood that uh, miners would take them down in their pockets to chase the rats and stuff yeah, in Wales. Yeah. Well. Um, and um, did your ancestors all pretty much live in Wales or did they come from uh, Normandy or anything like no, that? No, uh, my, on my paternal side, uh, they came from, uh, they had lived in Wales for going way back several centuries. On my maternal side, my, uh, grand, my maternal grandmother was from uh, Somerset in England, and uh, uh, my maternal grandfather was from, uh, I beg your pardon, my paternal grandfather was from Cornwall. So they're Cornish, but that's uh -huh. Celtic too. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And um, your mother, what was her name and her maiden name? Her maiden name was Jane Reese, R-E-E-S. Okay. And did you have any brothers and sisters? No. Okay. Um, how long did you live in Wales? Five years. Okay. And did your whole family uh, migrate or what? Uh, no, my mother and I uh, emigrated to the United States in May of 1927. We were on the Royal Mail ship Olympic, which, and she was the older sister of the Titanic. Right, yeah, I was just going to say. And uh -huh. the other sister, uh, the Britannic, was lost in World War I in the Mediterranean by a German mine, as I'm told. You know. uh, we came over in May of 1927 uh, and at that time, Lindbergh was, we were coming west and Lindbergh was yeah. flying east during that same period of time. And was that, were they still the White Star Line? The uh, yes, it was the that? White Star Line. Yes, yes, it was the White Star. Because the White Star Line's names of their ships all ended in IC. Right. Yeah. And the Canarders all ended in IA, uh, uh, Ergo Lusitania, Mauritania, right. etc. Was it still the opulence that you see on the Titanic uh, when we see pictures of it and stuff like that? Did uh, they have no, on the, Olympic uh, the, ti the Olympic was uh, had the same uh, framework uh, as the Titanic, and uh, but uh, the Titanic was more opulent in the staterooms and in the dining rooms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, that's my understanding. 
Um, and you remember a lot about the voyage? Uh, well, not a lot, but I do remember that uh, I had a little uh, British sailor suit with a little cap that said uh, HMS on it, a little cap. And uh, I had brown shoes. And I found out looking around that all the sailors had black shoes, and that that gave me a bad time, which I gave to my mother. <laughs> and uh, what was the purpose of you coming to the States? Why did you, got, you and your mom come? Okay, my, uh, my grandfather's older brother, Obadiah Reese, uh, lived here, and his wife had passed away, and uh, he sponsored my mother and I to come to the States. And in those days, even with that sponsorship, we had to wait two years. Really? And was your father to come later then? Uh, yes, yes, but my, my uh, parents were divorced oh. and uh, I became, I'm a derivative citizen of the United States through my mother's citizenship. Uh, there are no, I have no document uh, to, to tell me that I am a citizen except my passports which I got without any problem whatsoever. <laughs> So where did you come to in the States when you... Uh, we came to... Uh, where did you dock, first of all? Well, we docked in New York, and we came to uh, 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 Nanticoke, Pennsylvania, which is a suburb of Wilkes-Barre, Scranton area, the coal mining area, the, the old anthracite coal mining area, which no longer exists, exists up there. Yeah. Right. Okay, and uh, so and was uh, that was an uncle or somebody that you came to? Great uncle. Great uncle. Yeah, my grandfather's older brother, did my, he, ma my maternal grandfather's older brother. Did he work in the coal mines around oh, there absolutely. then? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yes he did. Yeah. Obadiah Reese. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what did your mom do? Uh, did she get a job? Or, or uh, yes. Uh, my mother, uh, at that time in 1927, she was born in 1900, was 27. And I must say that she was a natural redhead and a very attractive young lady. Uh, with this uh, kid, <laughs> precocious <laughs> kid, yeah, uh, following her around, and uh, she uh, uh, obtained work with the uh, Petite Babywear Company, which was a, uh, a, f a firm in New York. Oh, uh, we were living in New York at that particular time, and uh, uh, did babywear, and. Uh, she, although she never sold and couldn't sold, became the forelady for this uh, Jewish concern that made baby clothes. And my mother was the forelady of all of these people who sold. She couldn't sew herself, but she was a good manager. And she was well liked by the, pe by the, by the firm. In fact, they'd sent her to Florida on a paid vacation and all that good stuff. And she, she, she held that job until she uh, retired really, yeah. You know, she liked to work. So, how long were you in Pennsylvania before you went to New York? Uh, we went to Pennsylvania in 1927. I went to New York in 1940. Oh, okay. So, you really grew up in, in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania? Yes, I went to high school. Uh, grand, uh, high school okay. Do you remember the street that you lived on there? Yes, uh, uh, 20, uh, number 21 uh, North Chestnut Street. <laughs> right in the town of Wilkes-Barre? Uh, of Nanticoke, which was Nanticoke. six miles south of Wilkes-Barre. How, how big was that town? Uh, in those days it was about 25,000. I understand today it's under 12 because the coal, anthracite coal fields have long dissipated. Right. That's right. Yeah. And um, you grew up probably kind of during the Depression. How Absolutely. did that affect your family? Uh, not not uh, greatly. Uh, my uncle Obadiah owned his home, and uh, uh, my mother. Did the coal mines stay open all during the? Oh yes, oh yeah, they were open. Yes, okay. yes. In fact, uh, uh, I don't think they they closed sometime just about right after World War Two. I think yeah. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, uh, I went through uh, grammar school and high school. I was the out of a class of 290 some. I was the the baby because I had gone to school in the old country and they put me in first grade at five years old. So I was the baby of my class age-wise, yes. <laughs> so you had already been to school where these kids hadn't even been. That's right, oh, that's see. right, because oh, okay. of the system in the UK. In the, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, um, 
So, uh, what did you do for fun? Uh, you, uh, what, oh, well, just start when you were we played, uh, we played bunt ball, we played uh, uh, all kinds of uh, handball and uh, 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 touch football and all the usual stuff that kids in those days played. You know, right. yeah. I wasn't, excuse me, I wasn't uh, that big compared to my classmates because I was young. Uh, uh, but when I went to my first high school reunion after 35 years, I walked in, and of course you had your little, put your little badge on, and I must say, and I don't want to sound bragging, but I was the biggest uh, fellow in the best physical shape of all the guys in the class. I can, I can imagine. Most, most of my classmates were uh, Slavic, and the Slavic uh, boys uh, tended to mature earlier than uh, than others, and uh, a lot of them had been pretty heavy beer drinkers and that, and uh, they didn't they couldn't they couldn't believe it was me you know, and all that stuff. But was your was your family very religious when you were growing up? No, no. In fact, I'm not religious myself. I'm an agnostic. Okay. Uh, so you, you didn't go to church much or anything like that. Oh yes, oh yes. I uh, my father's youngest brother. Uh, who has probably passed away now, was an Anglican priest in the UK, same as Episcopal priest right. here. And he served World War II in North Africa as a chaplain for the British Army in North Africa in World War II. He'd probably be in his 90s now if he's alive. I, I have no way of knowing. He stayed in Wales. His name was Evan Sedgemore. Uh, no, I, uh, I was... Uh, baptized uh, an Anglican in Wales and confirmed an Episcopalian in uh, Pennsylvania and uh, but uh, uh, my my so-called scientific background I, I'm not a scientist but that background uh, got to me and I, I am I'm, I'm an agnostic you know. okay uh, define agnostic uh I don't. I don't believe in the, in the supreme being as such. Oh. Okay. Okay. Was would, would that be atheist? Yes. Yeah. It's very oh, okay. close to it. Yeah. And, I, I so, so I'm a Darwinian uh, <laughs> okay. follower. I, I'm a follower of Darwin. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, but I am not against religion at right, all in yeah, any way. Yeah. Um, I think agnostics, as I understand, believe in God but don't believe in formal religion. Uh, no, that's not. Uh, no, uh, you can. Uh, the uh, agnos agn uh, atheism and agnosticism are almost the same. Yeah, yeah, they're almost the same. Uh, it's just that way. That's the way I am. And my wife, my current wife, and my first wife are good Christians and all that. I I traveled the world extensively when I was working, all around the world. I've been exposed to many many religions, and uh, kind of studied them. Not, I'm not an expert, but I was aware of them, and I find out that uh, it's. Uh, very interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, when you were, were there any um, uh, catastrophes in the coal mines when you were oh, growing yes. up there? Yes. One in particular. My mother uh, had a boyfriend, had a friend, uh, uh, a Scotsman, and uh, he was killed in a in a mining accident. And uh, they weren't married, but. Uh, my mother had been divorced, but I, they were dating, you know, doing all uh -huh. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that really set her back quite a bit. And then she, later on, she met my, I'm sorry. That's okay. She, she, she met my, uh, my stepfather, who was uh, English from Bristol, England, and they were married later on and so forth. Yeah. What's, what is his name? No, what was his, his name was Alfred Kingdon, K-I-N-G-D-O-N. He happens to be a uh, first cousin of Cary Grant. Really? Yeah. His father and Cary Grant's, or Archibald Leach, his name right. is, mother, were brother and sister. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah that's uh, it. Um, did he ever have contact with uh, Oh, yes. Cary? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Whenever, uh, when they were living in New York, whenever Archie came to New York, he'd let them know and they, they'd be invited to the show and, uh -huh. and all that. You know, oh, you, yeah. Did yeah. you ever meet him? Uh, Cary? Not that I can remember. Um, so, where did where did your mom meet him? Uh, where did she meet Alfred? I forget. Was it in Pennsylvania or New York? In New York. Oh, oh so this was in New York. Oh. He was a 
he was a merchant seaman. And during World War II, uh, being in the Naval Reserve, he was uh, called into the Navy. And she met him when he was in the U.S. Navy. He was a bosun's mate. Uh, and, and a good bosun's mate. He knew his seamanship and all that stuff. So he was on several ships as the head bosun for all the young guys, that, you know, and all that stuff, yeah. So when you were growing up in um, Pennsylvania, well, first of all, did they make fun of your accent? Do you remember any, any I, of that? Uh, I think they did when I first got there, but I lost it very rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as Welsh is concerned, I never could speak, read, or understand that dumb language. <laughs> <laughs> Did your mom speak it? Well, yes, yeah, yeah. But only, only if the some of the Welshies got together, they would, they would, uh, they would yak away. There was uh, a. Did you live in a, in a Welsh neighborhood, more or less? No, uh, the neighborhood uh, that I lived in, fortunately, in Pennsylvania, uh, where most of the people were Slavic uh, background, it was mixed. There was no, uh, no, no ghetto of any kind of any one group of people. Like on our little street, uh, North Chestnut Street, there were six houses on the one side. I think we had every nationality in every one of those six houses and all that yeah. kind of stuff. No, we had no, uh, I do not, re uh, we had no blacks in, in the area because the United Mine Workers would not allow blacks in the Union in those days. And uh, so, but other than that, uh, between the Slavic peoples and all, the, and the Irish and the Welsh, there was no, uh, uh, no ghettoism or no, everybody looked at everybody. Any way. bad strikes, do you remember? When you were oh, yeah, well, there, there were strikes during those days. I don't remember. I mean, we didn't, we weren't affected in that regard. We always had enough food on the table and all that sort of but stuff. But I mean, did any of them get violent? You hear I, I, they probably did, but I really don't remember. Okay. Yeah. Now, your mom, so was she working uh, in the garment industry in Pennsylvania? No, no, in New York. Okay. Did, what did she do? And did she work at all in Pennsylvania? No, no, she didn't. She, she, she kept house for our uncle Obadiah. <laughs> oh, she did. And so he he kind of took care of you guys. For yes, us. he did. We had the house and all that stuff because his wife had passed away, oh. and his son, uh, my cousin, would be my, I guess a second cousin, Thomas, had gotten married and moved out. So we kept my mother kept house for. Uh, we had a two-story house. And we moved upstairs because the Doherty family with three kids moved in downstairs. We moved upstairs. And the Doherty boys, who are all deceased now, younger than me, uh, they're like foster brothers to me. I grew up with them and all that kind of stuff. You know, you know, very good. But for, unfortunately, all three of them are deceased. Uh, John's wife, Vicki Tomporowski, a Polish girl, and I were born the same day. In fact, I got a call her. She lives in Florida. She's my twin sister. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. What grammar school did you go to? In Pennsylvania. I, went I know, to, but what uh, was public. the name of it? What was the name of it? Oh, recall? I forget. Uh, State Street School. Okay. State Street, yeah. And what, what high school did you go to? At Nanticoke High School. It was, uh, it's now, uh, uh, in those days, in, in the Wyoming Valley, uh, which was a heavy anthracite coal mining area at that time, there were 11 high schools and football was the big, high school football was the big thing. And uh, uh, we didn't, uh, well, pro football was not around that much then and all that, but we, oh, high school football was the big thing. But I could, I, I was on the 18th. I was a human tackling dummy. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever, did you play any other sports in high school besides football? No, no, I didn't play basketball or, uh, no, I didn't play any sports. Sports. What were your favorite subjects in school? Did you like school? Oh yeah, I guess so. I I, uh, I fortunately have uh, I had a pretty good IQ. It was one thirty two or something like that, which is a pretty high IQ, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if I liked the subject, I could do well in it. And if I didn't like it, I passed. But I, well, I, I I went through high school with good grades. In fact. Uh, when I, I, I got into a fracas with a French teacher, I said something I shouldn't have said to her, and she flunked me in French. So when I wanted to go to UCLA, I had this flunk in French on my <laughs> high school report card. And the woman who was the superintendent, of, assistant superintendent of schools in Anacook at that time, erased that from the file because she said that was an anomaly. <laughs> Very nice lady, she yeah. did that for me. 
Do you remember any of your favorite teachers in high school you had? Uh, oh yes, a history teacher, John Davis. I like always liked history, I still do. I'm a history buff. Uh, the uh, physics teacher, I can't think of his name. He had one arm. He was a veteran of uh, World War One. Had lost an arm in World War One. And uh, uh, a very pretty English teacher. Yeah, she was a young, a young teacher. Most of the teachers in Pennsylvania in those days had tenure, and uh, uh, women who were married couldn't be teachers. Uh, I, I think that's right. They, they, they were, unless they were married, uh, I mean, teaching when they got married or something like that. Yeah, we had good teachers though. Yeah, yeah. I had a good. It was a good high school and. Uh, there was no fooling around in high school. You listened, uh, and uh, if the teacher thought you were thinking bad thoughts, out. And in those days, we only lost out of my class of 290 odd. We only had one dropout. Oh, well, I mean, the kids wanted to wanted to go to college, and uh, well, their, pa uh, their parents wanted them to too. Right, and only a very few were in the position that they could go at that time. I yeah. wasn't. I didn't have the funds to go. So uh, when I went into the service to come out, then of course I went right in, of course, about all that. Do you have any favorite sports teams? Uh, in those days? Not that I can remember. Not what was the, the nearest college to you? Would that be Penn State? or? Uh, no, that would be, uh, Penn State was, was one, and uh, in Philadelphia we had the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then we had uh, Scranton, uh, we had uh, St. Thomas. Catholic school up in Scranton, which is now Scranton U. I th I'm pretty sure it's Scranton U yeah. now, yeah. yeah. It was St. Thomas, a Catholic school. So what year did you graduate from high school? 1939. Okay, uh, in, Pennsylvania. in Pennsylvania. So what did you do after you graduated then? I uh, uh, hung around for a year. I got a job delivering groceries and stuff like that. It was the worst year of my life from the standpoint of uh, where am I going? No thoughts about working in the coal mines? No way. No way. No way. I have been in a coal mine once. Uh, fast forward for many years. I'm in uh, New Zealand, in Huntley, New Zealand, and we were doing a coal mine. I'm retired from Bechtel Corporation. We were doing a coal mine with a 45 degree slope, not a, a vertical slope. And I told the, the guy that, our, our guy in New Zealand, you know, I've got to say I've been down in the coal mine. So uh, we went down the 45 degree slope and I said, I have been in a coal mine. <laughs> and that's an actual fact. <laughs> Just to say I had done it, yeah. No, no coal mining for me, no way. So you, um, okay, uh, you weren't sure what you wanted to do then? Uh, yeah, in 1930, you know, and I did. So I went to New York and I worked at, uh, at Bickford's uh, cafeteria uh, for a, a little bit. Is this New York City? In, in New York City. And your mother was living there then too? Yeah, in 1940. Okay. Then I got a job with uh, American Surety Company as an accountant type stuff. And I stayed there for two years until I enlisted in the Army Air Corps in 1942. Yeah. Do you remember what you were doing December 7th, 1941? Yeah, I was walking, I was walking west on 32nd Street between 8th and 9th Avenue and I heard a radio. On my left side, I was walking west, and the Japanese had bombed the Pearl Harbor. Yeah, I remember that. I don't. Yeah. Remember, do you remember your thoughts about that? Were you up on current events? Or, oh yes. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, we were. Because when I was in high school, we had a pro one course called current events, and we followed Hitler's rise and uh, all that kind of stuff. So, oh yeah, I was, I was well up on. on and so, had you been interested in aviation prior to going into the Air Force, Air Corps? Uh, I'm not sure, but I went. I went. I wanted. To, I wanted to fly. I didn't want to be in the infantry. Uh, I didn't want to sit behind a desk all my life and all that stuff. So I enlisted in the Army Air Corps. I meant to back up just a little bit. Did you have any girlfriends in high school, or, oh, or yeah. by this time when you were? Oh yeah, I had. I had a girlfriend. I had some girlfriends. I dated. I didn't have. A girlfriend that you would say, I'm, uh, we, uh, she and I are g good friends. No, I dated several girls, all of whom have passed away uh, a long time ago, all of whom got married and all that stuff. But uh, I really didn't know what was up that much when I was in high school. <laughs> and 
when you went into the service, it was, did you have anybody serious that you were uh, no. even then either? No, okay. no. Uh, how about automobiles? Had you had a car by this time? Or no, you, but I, uh, I drove my Uncle Burns 1931 Chevy, uh, Chevy uh, convertible. Lord, with a rumble seat yeah, and all really, that stuff. Yeah. I could drive. I, had, I lied and got my license at 15. Uh, the reason I did it was I could use the car to take the trash to the city dump. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, then my other, my other uh, cousin uh, had a uh, Willys, had a Willys sedan, and when I went on a date or two, I could borrow the sedan as long as I didn't put any marks in it, all <laughs> yeah. that kind of stuff. You know. But I dated. I dated the girls, yeah, but it was purely just dating, yeah. And um, uh, so where was your first, uh, where'd you go to basic training then? When you In the, or, and when you joined? I never went to basic training. Oh, I oh, missed oh, it. Oh, you did? Okay, well. I was sent right to uh, the instrument school in Bryan, Texas, which was the Army Air Corps instrument school for eight weeks for instrument pilot training. And why, why? Why did I miss basic training? I don't know. Oh, they just, Never, I was never on a troop train, never rode a, when I, when I came out to California, I came on a, on a, and I'm a buck, buck private, I came out in a, in a Pullman, <laughs> all that stuff. Don't ask me why, it just happened. Because when I tell people, and it's, and it's uh, when I tell people about that, they don't believe me. I said, I never went to basic training. And, uh, so forth, but I, I can prove that I went to instrument flight school because it's on my discharge. Eight weeks uh, in Bryan, Texas. Well, yeah. it, it was a high priority. Probably they must have needed those kind of guys. I guess so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what was that like then for your eight weeks? Oh, I, I liked that. I enjoyed that very much. We were at Bryan. We took courses at Texas A and M, which was across the grinder there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have an interesting little anecdote if you want to hear sure. it about that. Uh, uh, Texas A&M uh, and Bryan and the Bryan uh, uh, base, uh, in between them is a big grinder uh, with the pathways going back and forth across this big grinder, No, dried up grass and all that oh, stuff. I see. Okay. So one Saturday morning, because we took classes like in meteorology, we took them at, at, uh, at Texas A&M uh, on, on meteorology. I was coming back from class, going back on, over across, halfway across this grinder with my khakis on, with no, 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 no chevron. I didn't have my chevrons on. And uh, my cap, uh, I, I was on, my cap was stuck in my pocket. And across, coming across the other way is a, a, a senior at Texas A&M with his campaign hat and his medals and his pantaloon pants and his boots and his stick. And of course, we're walking across, and as we go by, I hear this, hey, fish. Well, it happened to be that a fish was a freshman at A&M. And I turned around, and I forget the little details, but I, I said to him, I went all decked out, I said, gee, that's a nice sword you got there. He said, are you a fish? And I said, no. <laughs> okay, fast forward to that evening. Uh, the country club used to have uh, put on uh, evenings for the for servicemen. So I, at that time I had my uniform on with my stripes on and we go to the evening because it's nice and there are girls there to dance with the music and all that good stuff. And in comes his nibs. And to his, to, to, uh, to, to his favor, he spotted me then with my stripes on and he walked up and we were, I was talking to some girls or something like that and he walked up and he said, said something to this effect, I have to apologize to the sergeant here, and he reiterated the, the story. Oh. So he wasn't a bad guy, and he said, that, <laughs> so we had a nice evening together and all that oh, kind great. of stuff. Yeah, that yeah, 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 that's yeah. But, that, but that's an absolutely true story. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I'll never do that again. <laughs> so what, what's your, what was that like uh, as far as, what did you have to learn and stuff like that? Uh, oh, had to learn uh, all about uh, instrument flying, uh, flying blind. Uh, we what we did is uh, at Palm Springs here, we would uh, go through the, the the link in the morning on a syllabus uh, and uh, with state of the art 
for those days. Well, okay. the radio range, all, all, all oral, all oral, with the blacked out the cockpit. Okay. Uh, in the, yeah, yeah, describe uh, a link trainer for, for okay, us. Okay, it's just like a, just like a, the, the, the cockpit is just like an airplane. You have the cockpit, and uh, with all the instrument panel, all the instruments. And we added in our because we had an advanced school here. We added engine instruments and a few other things on the side to make it advanced because the uh, pilots who wanted to come to our school had to have a thousand hours behind the wheel or the stick to apply for this school. So. They were very interested in all that kind of stuff. So uh, we'd bring them in and we'd put them through the course in the morning in the trainer. And then in the afternoon, they would go up in a C-47. They'd fly the left-hand seat and the flight, the flight instructor would fly the right-hand seat and they would go through the same syllabus in the air around here doing various things. State of the art for 1940, uh, for World War II. Yeah. So in that eight, when you were do, taking your training, your eight eight weeks down there, do, were you working with a link trainer at that time? Oh yes, and flying too. Yeah, we had we flew all over Texas, mm -hmm. uh, looking for bad weather, uh, so that we could uh, firsthand see what happened to the instruments when you had a, electric charge and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the the instruments would tend to go, and also uh, uh, we'd fly. Well, okay, see you you flew blind in the air. Uh, you put uh, uh, the pilot uh, would have a big red goggle, and we'd put green ple uh, what was plexiglass then or whatever it was sheets in the windscreen and the side windows, so that that uh, the red and the bl and the green became black, but he could see everything in the cockpit because it would all be red. That's that's how you got him into a blind really? situation. That's right. And so did you go straight to Palm Springs from from uh, your instrument training? Uh, for, uh, no, I was in Long Beach, and then I came down here. I was in Long Beach for a short while, and I was uh, sent down here. And when you came here, what did you find? What was the base like? And that well, there were about 75 personnel on the base. The commanding officer was the first lieutenant, Paul Herbert. We had about five officers on the base, an engineering officer, a, a doctor, uh, operations officer, or something like that. and. Uh, uh, mostly non-coms because it was a, uh, this was a, uh, a, a trans, it was a transition. Uh, besides being a fairing spot, bringing the, uh, the the planes through the pass and ROing or remain overnight here, we also taught this advanced instrument school here because of that we could get we had good weather. And all so that it was stuff. a ferry command here. It was the twenty-first ferry command yeah. as opposed to the sixth. For quite a while, they were we were the. Uh, a spin-off from the 6th in Long Beach and then it became independent as the 21st and uh, yeah. When did they establish the the base here? April 42, April 42 and I got here in October. And what 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 did they have tarmac down on the runways and stuff? Uh, oh yes, oh yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we had our main our our main runway was 5000 feet. I know that because we couldn't get a B29 down later on. Because they needed more than five thousand feet uh, paved. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We had hard stands all over the place. You know, you know. How many planes at a time would normally be here? Oh, well, as many as one hundred and fifty. Really? All over the place, packed up all over the place. Yeah. Come through the pass as a like a freeway. Because <laughs> see, it came through the pass at about five thousand feet, and the and the the uh, the pass is twenty twenty four hundred feet, I think, above grade. So Were they coming out of the factories and around uh, Long Beach and, and all lots of places, lots of places. Yes, factories and, and yeah, from up and down the coast. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the only way they could get here, except to fly over the high mountains, was to come through the pass. Yeah, yeah. 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 it'd be like a freeway in the, in the afternoon. You know, <laughs> then the next morning they would take off for their various and sundry to get armaments, what to whatever. Uh, mission that they were going to be on, whether they were bombers or uh, flighters or transports and all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, pretty, uh, pretty noisy place, I guess. Oh, I know, yeah, very noisy. Did you have barracks on the base? Oh, yes, you we had in? barracks on the base. In fact, they're in the picture. The barracks are on the right-hand side, uh, and then the, the PX and the, uh, the gymnasium and operations and all that stuff are on the left-hand side of, of, of Tokwitz. I had uh, interviewed a couple of WASPs 
who yep. were stationed here. Uh, I think they're the same two I know. I, 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 I think they are. Yeah, Vivian the and the picture uh, with, uh, with Don Wilkinson and I. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when did they did the, when did they come aboard? Uh, forty four. And they didn't last long because they disbanded them very shortly after that. You know, it's too bad because they were very competent uh, pilots and all that stuff. Yeah. Now, Don Wilkinson, you mentioned him. He's a good friend of ours and a, a volunteer here at the Air Museum. Now, how did you? When did you first meet him? And tell us about that. Well, let me go back and uh, this this is very interesting. First off, in 1940. I was working at American Surety Company in New York, across from the uh, the church, the old uh, the church there. St. Patrick's. Not St. No. Patrick's. The little church down in Wall, down at the bottom of Wall Street there. Oh. Uh, I forget the name oh. of the church. I forget. And uh, I was working at 100 Broadway. Don was working around the corner at General Electric, but we didn't know each other. But uh, we we, are, we got there. Okay. Fast forward now. To 1945, my last class here uh, was uh, July of 45, and Don uh, in the Advanced Instrument School. Don was in that class, <laughs> so obviously I had him training, and I said I flunked him, but all I got was one But you remember him? I mean, well, you remember the, each other? I didn't know. I didn't remember him, but I must have remembered remember. because he'd be my student. Sure, okay. Right. Okay. So, yeah. So that was our other connection. Yeah. So when I first met him afterwards, we started going back and back. And, sure, he said, uh, uh, oh, I must have known you, but we didn't remember each other uh, physically at the time. That's yeah. right. And then we got together again, uh, fast forward. And what was the rest of the valley like uh, when you were here during those years? Sand. Sand, mesquite, scorpions, sidewinders. Palm Springs was... Uh, about 2,500 people. What did you do when you went on leave? Well, you mean, oh, you yeah, mean at mean, night? Uh, at night, yeah. I mean, we fun. went to the Chi Chi Bar. My, uh, and, uh, or uh, the Chi Chi Bar, or uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Charlie Farrell's uh, Racket Club. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Chi Chi Bar was our real hangout. There was one other one, I can't think of the name of it now. My wife's uncle uh, owned the Chi Chi, but not then. It was later on. Like yeah, in the 60s, that was a. In 60s. fact, I understand it's still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you um, um, did you see many celebrities around? Oh yes. Movie stars and stuff. Oh yes. Oh yes. Uh, Jackie Coogan was here for a little bit. Uh, Donald O'Connor was here for a bit. You're talking about in the in the, in the service, service coming service. rotating through your place. Yeah, oh, they, okay. they came through in the service. Uh -huh. uh, Joey Brown's oldest son, Don Brown, spelled D-O-N-N, was killed out here, and mm -hmm. in, a, in an A-20 uh, up north of the base here. Uh, he, uh, no one knows, but he tried to land with his gear down. Maybe he couldn't get it up or something. And he cartwheeled and was killed because uh, Joe E. Brown, who was a gentleman of the first order, came out and wanted. To, he was my CO. Don was my uh, squadron commander. Uh, he was the captain, and Joey wanted to interview everyone that was in the squadron and uh, thanked us profusely for. Him. And I got his autograph and everything from Joey Brown on that. Yeah, he was a very, very nice man. It broke him up though. It really broke him up. And his wife was Billy, Benny. Benny. What was his wife's name? Benny, Benny something. Benny, Benny, Benny Barnes. Benny Barnes, yeah. Benny, Bar Benny Barnes, that's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. We met her, and yeah. uh, very nice, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, did you, when you went into Palm Springs, did, was there any entertainment, like any uh, stars come around, for, like USO shows or anything like that in the area? Uh, yes, yes, in fact, we uh, went. We had a show at our gym, our, at our gymnasium uh, theater building, and uh, it was a, a preview of the movie that she did with uh, Bogart, uh, 
where the one that where she says uh, L Lauren Bacall you're talking about yeah Lauren oh, Bacall right. Right. Yeah. whistle <laughs> uh, yeah that's well we were we were, they had a sneak preview and of course we were there and uh, we were sitting there uh, chatting and uh, my friend and I it was the, my good friend and uh, uh, blah blah talk and making making remarks about the movie and all that stuff. And when the lights came on, who was sitting right next to us but Lauren McCall. Really? <laughs> and she was so nice. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, a, a real trooper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nothing bad. So we got, in, to, we got to meet her. Yeah. In that show, she was still a teenager. Oh, you know, yeah. I mean, oh yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. She was really something. Yeah. Um, do you still have uh, contact with any of your buddies from uh, in the service? They're all gone. Last of the ones that I know about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll be 85 in January, you know, and uh, most of them are gone. I can't say all be. Now, I'm talking about the ones I was close with. They're all gone. The ones I was real close with are all gone. Some of the ones that I was friendly with or within the thing, I'm not sure of. They've scattered them out. Now, this, all of the, your students that you took to, did they all adapt to it pretty well, or did some of them not be able to? Pick up the instruments. And yeah, stuff. Uh -huh. there were a few. Uh -huh. yeah, there. Well, I shouldn't say that because these guys all had a lot of time. Uh, if we flunked anybody out, it was uh, minimal, I, I think, because they wanted to come, they applied to come, so they weren't forced into it uh, as a part of their training and all that sort of stuff. And what was you? What did you actually do as far as the training is concerned? Put them I mean, in the physically. Link, put them in the link trainer in the morning, go through our syllabus, fly a syllabus in the link, then in the afternoon they'd get in the C-47 and do the same syllabus in the air. Now you, you being a, an enlisted and they being officers, was that a problem at all? No, no. We, uh, because we had uh, one time like we had 40, enlist, 40 enlisted men and about 200 officers on the base. Uh, no, uh, my exposure to officers in my period of time was very, very normal, very good. The officers didn't mind you telling them. No way. You know, they were or, here because or, they wanted to be or, here. Or, you know, no. and, and in the army, them in, or whatever. In the yeah. Army Air Corps, I found that there were very few officers who felt that way because uh, we were giving them training and uh, no, and we respected their rank, sure, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in fact, uh, I had one chap there, this is an anecdote, if I have to remember a second, get it right. This chap came in uh, with his winter uniform on and uh, it turned out he was a West Pointer. Uh, and he had gone through flight training as an officer, so he went through in a nice way. You know, he didn't have to go through all the stuff that the cadets had to go through. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, he, uh, we passed on the ba something on the uh, something happened on the base here, and he he uh, told me off, read me off. Okay, so I couldn't say anything. Well. When the, the when that and I was on my way to work, so when I get to the to to the to the building, and who comes in as one of the students but this guy, and I said to him, Lieutenant, uh, yes, you'll be my student. He turned white. <laughs> I could see him saying, I I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Well, as it turned out, he was very sharp, and he passed uh, with flying colors, and I told him that. Well, he came around the next day with a bottle of scotch for me uh, <laughs> and said that was my West Point training, but uh, thank you and all that. Well, he, he deserved it. I didn't. In fact, I made it even a little tougher on him, and he was good. He was good. He said, "Make it. Don't don't make it. Make it tough on me." And he was good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, do you remember uh, when you first heard about the bomb being dropped, the atomic bomb? Yes. Uh, that was on a Monday or Tuesday, the what, 14th or 15th or something, the 15th or 16th, because uh, I was here and, uh, no, wait a minute, no, wait a minute, hold on a second. No, I was in Long, back in Long Beach, I went back in the 1st of, 1st of August, 
we were married on the 19th, so this happened a couple of days before. So I was in, in Long Beach when that happened, yeah, yeah. when we heard about it. Oh, boy. Well, we're getting married, so it's good that the war is going to be over and all that stuff. I could, I had, they couldn't send me overseas because I had too many points <laughs> at the time. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Just some service time. Okay, so your, your fiancé at the time, where did you meet her and what was her name? Uh, Gladys. Uh, uh, I met her here. Didn't I tell you that? No, we haven't her? talked about that yet. Oh, we haven't, huh? No, well, we haven't. What was I talking about? Okay. Uh, March 31st, 1945. Uh, we're having a... Uh, uh, it's a Saturday night. Uh, Ziggy Elman is here with his band to uh, do the whole thing in, in the gymnasium and all that stuff. And they're bringing up some girl, some waves and women marines from Long Beach for the Saturday night to show them Palm Springs, etc., etc., like that. So uh, my friend and I, Blimp, Bob Felger, who was the big guy, who was my best man at my wedding, uh, six five and about two forty, and big, uh, was passed away since. But anyway, uh, we were in town at the Chichi. And we had uh, credit at the Chi-Chi, uh, say like fifteen dollars for the month, something like that. And when we it was a deal, when we ran out, the guy that owned the Chi-Chi said, uh, "No more until you get paid on Monday, cash. We got pay, pay your bill, and we're back on credit again." Let's go out the basement and get some free beer. So we come back out here. In those days, they they didn't have uh, plastic; they had wax coated cups. You know those mm -hmm. wax yes, coated. I know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, get some beer and we walk into the gym and it was a break in the in the, in the dance. You know how they had the sets, the band had sets. And we look across the, 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 the dance floor and there's a good looking blonde over there. And I said, Felger, I'm going for the blonde. And uh, okay. And, uh, and I said, wait a minute. You can have the blonde. I'm going for the brunette next to her, which happens to be Gladys. So we had we walk across, and of course, uh, I had connections with all. My uniform was pre-war. I mean, everything I had was tailored, official, enlisted, but not the stuff they served you in World War II. I mean, you can see it in my pictures, class, because <laughs> we did exchange all this stuff. And uh, we walked across, and I. Uh, I said, hold it, no, you can have the blonde, I'm going for the brunette next to her. So I walk over and it's Gladys and I said, uh, it, be, between sets I said, uh, may I have the, the the next dance with you? And she she was about 5'9", I guess, no, five, yeah, five, I forget, 5'7", five, 5'9". Five, she, look, she looked up at me down her nose and said, bug off, Buster, in the vernacular of the day. And Felger is laughing at me. Ho, 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 you think. So I walk back over. That doesn't happen to me very often. But. And the music starts, and I'm looking the other way. I get a tap on the shoulder, and here she is. She said, I'll dance with you now on my terms. That was March 31st, a Saturday night, and there's a thing on the wall out there about uh, what happened that night and all that stuff. It was a Saturday night. So uh, we were married on August 19th. You know? So I only saw her. Uh, a dozen times. So I, she was in the service? She was in the Navy. In, yeah, she in was a wave? A, a yeoman, yeah, I which know. was, uh, yeah. yeah. She was... Uh, what was her maiden name? Gladys DeWire. And, and where was she from? Where did she grow up? She grew up in uh, uh, New York, uh, uh, in uh, upstate New York, up the, up the Hudson River, Brewster, New York, which is across from, she was born in Connecticut, because the hospital was over in Danbury, that was all oh, that kind okay. of stuff. Uh, but uh, I saw her, that was, I had never had a steady girl, but boy, it was it was the love at first sight type thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, for, no, she had a boyfriend, but he was overseas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we, we, we hit it off, and yeah. uh, as I said, I only saw her maybe a dozen times and we got married, and it, it worked out fine, you know. So you were still in the service when you yeah. got married. Yes. So uh, both of us. And where was she stationed? At? Long Beach. She was in Long Beach. Yeah. And so, uh, how long did you stay in the service? Uh, I got out on the fifth of February, forty-six. I had a fight tooth and nail to get out. They didn't want to let me out uh, because I had a 
uh, critical MOS. And I said, come on, I'm a buck sergeant and I have a critical, this is my, my military occupation, you know what MOS is. So I finally groused and griped and everything else. And finally they came to me in January of, uh, of 46 and said, Sedg, we got a deal for you. Uh, we'll give you your discharge. If, uh, and we understand that you've applied at UCLA to go to school. Uh, if you'll uh, work here three afternoons a week, Monday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from two to five, we'll pay you three dollars an hour, which was good money in those days. I had a War Department thing that was a 40 hour week pay, but when you put it down to 15 hours, it came out to three. Fine. So I did that until August of 45 when they closed the base. So I got a, I still have my W-2 form. I got about $1,100. Oh, nice, you know, very nice. So that worked out. August 46. Yeah, I mean August 46, right. yeah. 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 Oh, it worked out very nice, yeah. 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 And uh, so where were you guys living then? In Long Beach. We lived at uh, 1750 East Ocean Avenue, which is now a motel, I understand, or something. I forget whatever it was anyway, because she was, she got out of the Navy in uh, October, November of 45, and I got out the 1st of February 46, yeah. And, and those, she, that last six months uh, of 45, where were you stationed? Were you still here in Palm Springs, or were you in no, Long, Long Beach? Long Beach, yeah. yeah. Okay. Says thank you. Thank you for your service to our country and to the Air Museum, too. And